think we've kind of already got the spirit of what I'm going to preach about tonight. And uh, seemed like it's been that way from the first song. Just been a good spirit here tonight, and I praise the Lord for that. I want to bow for a moment of prayer, and then we're going to read just one verse tonight for our text verse, and then we're going to share a message with you that I feel that God would have us to. Our Heavenly Father, we come now in Jesus' name, and we thank you, Lord, for the sweet presence of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that's in our midst tonight. And I pray that you'll meet with us now as we look into your word, and I pray that your word will be what we need for this hour. I pray you'll stir our hearts and challenge our hearts tonight. And help us, Lord, as we leave this place, that we might be a better Christian than we were when we came. I pray that every heart will be open to the Word of God tonight and that, that each heart, Lord, will be receptive to the things you have to say. I ask you to use me according to your own will and your own way, and I pray you'll get glory to yourself through everything that's said and done in the message. And we'll be grateful and we'll thank you for all that you do because it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> in the book of Job, chapter number 6, I want to read just one verse for a text verse where Job said, Oh, that I might have my request and that God would grant me the thing that I long for. We're just going to read that one verse tonight and I'm going to do what they teach you not to do in homiletics. I'm going to take this verse from its context and uh, make an application from it tonight. Of course, the context of this scripture, Job was kind of doing like we do sometimes when we have what I call a pity party, and we began to think, poor old me. I think Job had more cause to have one than most of us do, and uh, if we measure it by rights and by circumstances. But Job made this statement, and he said, Oh, that I might have my request, and that God would grant me the thing that I long for. I want to preach tonight on the thing I long for. The thing I long for. If I were to ask you tonight, if you could have any request, or if you could have the thing that you long for, there would probably be many, many different things given as to what you would make your request and what the longing of your heart is. I want to share with you tonight what's been on my heart for the last four or five weeks. And that is this. If I had the thing I long for before Jesus comes, I'd love to see real revival among God's people. I really would. I'd love to see a real revival among the people of God. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight, about revival. I said that I've been praying for four or five weeks and to seek the will of God and I've been thinking about maybe having a spring revival and I can't seem to get settled on a preacher and I just can't seem to get the right kind of liberty and uh, about it and the thought occurred to me the other day well maybe the Lord wants us to have revival he may not he may just not be interested so much in just scheduling a meeting and uh, I, that suits me just fine we've had some of them around here at times and days gone by and that suit me just fine if we just had revival. I think sometimes we get to the point where we preachers feel like that, you know, that we have spring revival and fall revival and that's the only time God can move and revival is in spring and fall. And uh, we try to put God into our plans and programs. I believe we ought to plan and prepare, but I believe that we ought to be sensitive to the Lord I think we ought to give God uh, the, the free right of way to do as he pleases and to be sensitive to his leadership. Now, I'm not saying we won't have spring revival. Uh, as far as the scheduled meeting, I don't know. I, I know one thing, unless God settles my heart, I learned a long time ago that you don't just up and do something just to be doing it. And uh, I want God to be in what I do. But I want to preach tonight on the thing I long for and that longing that's within my heart is to see a revival among God's people. I've experienced somewhat, I believe, of revival. I think 
in days gone by, there have been times when I've experienced somewhat of a move of God. We've experienced it around here. I remember back, I believe it was back in 87, uh, we had revival break out around here one time and, and uh, just come back on Monday night. In fact, I think we had about the best attendance <clears throat> by about Tuesday night of that revival of any revival we've ever had. It was unannounced. It was unscheduled. God just moved in. And we had revival. I believe we were about 12 people saved from Sunday to Wednesday. And, uh, I mean, it just seemed like in those days about the only thing we had to do was just show up. And, uh, and then God just took over from the time we showed up and, and uh, we had revival. Now, I'd love to see real revival among the people of God. I'd love to get in on real revival. I'm not talking about just a series of meetings where you come in and have a week of meeting and you sing and shout and rejoice and, it, and it's dead by the time the evangelist uh, gets over the hill and his taillights are, are out of sight while the revival's gone. I'm talking about something that moves in and not just stirs us but changes us and makes a real difference in our life. I believe, and I don't mean to... Uh, just sound critical tonight, but I believe this with all my heart that this generation knows very little about real revival. If you read the revivals of yesteryear and read some of the things that's recorded in religious history of revivals of the past, I think we know very little about real revival. But my heart's desire and the longing in my heart is that God would bring real revival to his people in these days in which we live. I want to mention just four or five things tonight that I long to see revival do in our midst, in our heart, in our churches, and among us as individuals. First of all, I want to say tonight that I, that I long to see a revival that will call God's people to repentance. I believe this is one of the reasons why we don't really see real revival is because we have convinced ourselves somehow that God is going to bless us and honor us and send revival to us in spite of the fact that we practice repentance very little among Christians. Second Chronicles 7, 14, I believe this is true today as it was the day it was written. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. I believe that verse of Scripture is still true today, that God would still honor that. And you notice he said, if my people, if my people. I believe when people really get to the place and, and they come to that place of real repentance before the Lord, I believe they forget others. They quit worrying about everybody else. And it's kind of like that old song that you used to hear sing years ago. It's not my brother, it's not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And we reach a place to where that it's not others we're so concerned about as it is ourselves. We, we forget others. <clears throat> There's two things that we do much of the time in relation to others and that is we compare ourselves to others. Now, Paul said that is not wise to do that. If you want to turn your Bibles tonight, let me just read a verse to you out of 2 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter number 10 and verse number 12. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse number 12. I want you to listen to what Paul said about this matter of comparing ourselves to others. He said in verse number 12, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Usually there's two reasons that others get involved in our life. Number one, we compare ourselves to others in order to condemn others. We compare ourselves to someone else, and by comparing ourselves to someone else, we come away from that comparison feeling like that we're something in the sight of God and looking down on somebody else and feeling like, well, boy, look, compared to them, I'm a pretty good Christian. 
I don't really do like they do. And so we look at others sometimes and compare ourselves to others in a, in a, in a condemning way in order to make ourselves look good. And then there's another way we compare ourselves among ourselves that hinders us from real repentance, and that is this. We not only look at others at times to condemn them, but we look at others to condone them. And we look at others and we say, well, they're doing it, so it must be all right. And so we justify ourselves by the fact that everyone around us is doing it. Now, I'll tell you, we, this is notorious among young people. Amen. Hey, I mean, you parents know what I'm talking about. If you confront one of your children about something, they say, they'll say, well, dad or mom, everyone else is doing it. But it don't stop with just young people. We adults do the same thing. We compare ourselves among ourselves and we allow others to condone the things wrong in our life that hinders us from repentance. But I want to tell you, real repentance will cause you to forget about others and come to the realization that it's not what they're doing that counts in my relationship to God, but it is me and my relationship to God. What your relationship to God is has nothing to do with somebody else. Paul said, it is not wise to compare yourselves among yourselves. doesn't make any difference if you're doing so in order to condemn others or to condone others. If it keeps you from real repentance in your relationship to God, you're not wise to do it. So I believe real repentance tonight will cause you to forget others. Real repentance tonight will cause you to face yourself. Real repentance causes us to face ourselves. It causes us to look that fellow in the eye that we see in the mirror every morning and see him for really what he is. Not what others see us, but to see ourselves the way that we really are. You know what I believe repentance causes us to do? You see, here in this, I said a moment at the beginning that we're caught up in this business of others and we're always relating our life to others. But I want to tell you, it's not what others think about you, it's what others, or it's what God knows about you that really counts. And, and, and we somehow feel like that if we measure up to others and if we gain the approval and the acceptance of others, then that's all right. But listen, it is what God knows about us that is going to make the difference in your life and mine. We face ourselves. Real repentance will bring you to the place that you face yourself, see yourself for what you are in the sight of God. In other words, you see yourself the way God sees you talking about a revival that would call us to real repentance, bring us to the place that we see ourselves, that we're willing to face ourselves. You know what happens when we really see ourselves? We not only get to the place that we forget others and face ourselves, but we get willing to forsake sin. When you really see you get willing to turn from, and that's what repentance is. It is when the wheel is broken and the mind is changed, and we do an about face about things in our life, and we turn from things unto the Lord. Revival will never come apart from real repentance that'll bring us to the place that we fall at the feet of Jesus, willing to forget others, to face ourselves and forsake our sin. We'll never see real revival apart from repentance. I'm convinced of that. And I thought about this week, and I'm grateful to God. I'm grateful to God for the victory that our military and the Allied troops have won there in the Middle East. I, I'm grateful to God for that. I'm grateful to God for the agreement that was reach today. I pray that every detail will be carried out as agreed. And I pray our boys will come home and our uh, women will come home just as soon as possible. But I want to tell you something. There's a, I believe that, that America, based on past experience, the swift victory we enjoyed 
is a danger to the spirit. And now listen, understand what I'm saying. It is a danger to the spiritual welfare of this country because I want to tell you what America's known for. America's known for being haughty and built up in pride and being like the church of Laodicea that we're increased with goods and have need of nothing. I want to tell you, I've seen a turn toward God during these past few days that I haven't seen in America in many of a year. And I believe that we are right on the verge of revival. And instead of being built up in pride and haughtiness and self-sufficiency, we ought to come away from that experience in the Middle East, praising God and giving glory to the one who really brought the victory in the beginning. That'll cause, I believe there's some repentance going on from some people. And I believe that it'll cause us to forget others, to face ourselves and forsake sin. When we come to the place of real repentance, and I pray that in our country and in our land and even in our community, in our church, in our hearts and in our lives, that we'll have revival to the point that it'll bring us to the feet of Jesus with a broken and a contrite spirit to repent of our sin and be willing to forsake our sin for the sake of having a real revival. I'll tell you something else I believe about the nature of real repentance. It's not a matter that we just, you know, a lot of folks are sorry for sin because they got caught up with in their sin. We don't, we fail sometimes, and, and, and I mentioned a moment ago, we're, all, we're so caught up in others and we worry about our sin. And I hear people talk about, and this is true, I hear people talk about that no man lives and dies unto himself. And when a man falls into sin, that it's not only himself that he hurts, but it's all these others, people that are affected by his sin and, and all these different other lives that is hurt. Very seldom do you ever hear anyone talk about how that it breaks the heart of God over sin. I believe real repentance not only makes you aware of what your sin does to yourself and what it does to your family and others, but I believe real repentance will cause you to come face to face with what your sin does to God. You heard me say it before. I say it again. It's never left me in all these years. And I, I'm a man nearly 45 years old, but I can still remember my mother telling me when I do wrong, that my wrong breaks the heart of Jesus. Every time you do wrong, son, it breaks the heart of Jesus. And that's true. That's true. That's good preaching that I was preached when I was a little old boy, that our sin breaks the heart of Jesus. Sure, it, it hurts others around us. But what about Jesus? You want me to tell you the times that I've come more, I'm talking about a biblical, godly repentance. It's not so much when I've been caught in sin, not so much when I've affected others, but when I've faced my sin to the point that I see what it does to God. To think that God's heart is broken because of our sin. That's real repentance. If you don't see people get really get right with God, it's when they see their sin and what it does to their relationship to God. Oh, we think we get by with others, we're fine. As long as we're comparing ourselves among ourselves. But what about God? I'm talking about a real revival that, that calls God's people to real, genuine, biblical repentance. That causes us to turn and forsake our sin. Secondly tonight, the thing I long for in this revival is not only to see a revival that calls God's people to real repentance, but in the second place tonight that would cause us to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now I preached on this a little bit this morning about that hunger. Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. But I long to see the day when God's people hunger and thirst after righteousness and hunger after the things of God, that hunger for, for God more than gold and silver of this world, that hunger for His power more than pleasure, that have a genuine hunger of heart for the things of God. 
I mean, I'm talking about a hunger that'll make you look forward to going to church again. I'm talking about a hunger that'll put a sparkle in your eye and a spring in your step about the things of God that'll put, you, put joy in your heart over the things of God. I'm talking about a hunger that's within your heart. Do you know tonight the junk of this world has just about destroyed the spiritual appetite of most folks tonight? We're so full of the world and so full of junk that we don't have much of an appetite for the things of God. I used to live in them days growing up back there when you could buy a candy bar for a nickel. Y'all remember those days? Man, I bought a candy bar the other day, stopped to get some gas, and you know how you have one of them urges every once in a while, very seldom I eat a candy bar, and just thought I'd get a candy bar, and I bought a Fifth Avenue. I used to eat them when I was a kid and pay a nickel for them, and that thing was 59 cents. <laughs> 59 cents for a candy bar. And I remember I used to eat them Fifth Avenues and them Butterfingers, they're kind of first cousins, you know, Butterfingers and Fifth Avenue. You know, those of you familiar with candy, I remember that when I was a kid. But just as sure, just as sure as I'd save my lunch money and just as sure as I'd stop by that store and eat a candy bar on the way home from school and my mom always cooked a hot meal for supper every day of my life that I was growing up and just as sure as I stopped and ate a candy bar on the way home from school and drank a Coca-Cola or a new grape, She'd know it. You know how she'd know it? Because I'd just sit there and pick around at my food. I didn't have much of an appetite when I'd done that. And that's exactly the way we are spiritually. We, we eat and snack on the, on the junk food of this world and we come to church and we don't have much of an appetite for the things of God. There's no hunger there for the things of God. When you're real hungry, you don't pick and choose. When you're real hungry, you just eat whatever's out there. I mean, I can even like broccoli when I'm hungry. I, I can eat spinach when I'm hungry. If you're hungry, you just eat what's, what's put out there. You, you don't pick and choose. We sit down at the table today, and Carrie said, She'd gone up the street and come back. And she said, well, where, where's my salad at? I said, well, you're here. Don't, they don't need to get up. You can have mine. I don't want it anyway. I wasn't that hungry. And, and, and the reason I gave to her, it's not because I don't eat, uh, well, it was, I think it was slaw, it wasn't salad. But, but uh, it's not that I don't eat that. I just... I just wasn't that hungry. You know what we do? I was thinking about that today. You know what we do? We come to church, and if we're not hungry, we'll pass ours on to somebody else. We'll just send it on back to the person behind us back there, and we won't bother with it. But when we're hungry, we come through the doors hungry. Isn't it amazing how good the singing I don't know if that choir was singing better than usual or not tonight. I just was hungry when I come to church. It sounded awful good to me. I, and I mean, when you're hungry, when the table's spread, you just slide up on the table and eat. When you're hungry, you don't pick and choose. Say, well, I like this or I don't like that. I mean, listen, I've heard that song, Lean On Me. We've been singing that song around here three or four years. I don't know how many times we've sung that song. I can sing that song, my eyes closed, by heart. Know every word of it. We sang it so many times. That song sounded good to me tonight. <laughs> I, that's a blessing to my heart tonight. I, I got some food out of that song that I'd heard all those times before. I mean, it's, it's just that way. When you're hungry, you don't pick and choose and say, well, I like this song or I don't like that song or this song moves me or that song don't move me or this kind of preaching does something for me or that don't do much for me and I need this or I don't need that. I mean, when you're hungry, you just slide up on the table and eat. I long to see the day when we really hunger for God's presence. Look with me, if you will. Let me share a couple of verses with you right quickly. Look with me in the book of Psalms. We're in Job. Turn to Psalms, or I believe it was in 2 Corinthians last, but look with me in the book of Psalms, chapter 42. Psalms, chapter 42. Verse 
David knew what that hunger was all about. In Psalms 42, verse number 1, he said, As the heart paineth after the water brooks, so paineth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God. For the living God, when shall I come and appear before God? I don't believe that David was talking about here when he died and went to heaven and stood in the presence of God. But I believe that he was talking about the presence of the Lord that he had experienced in days gone by. And he said, As the heart paineth after the water brook, so paineth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? to come with a hunger for the presence of God. How long has it been? You know what I'm talking about when you just hunger for the presence of God. Just, I mean, just to sense the manifested presence of God. How long has it been since you've had a real hunger for the presence of God? I mean, to just, to just sense His presence. Sometimes I come to church and as I walk across the yard coming to church, I have a prayer on my heart. Oh, God, meet with us today. Meet with us today. There's a, a hunger within my heart to just to dwell in the presence of the Lord and to sense His presence. There's a hunger there. How long has it been since we've really hungered for His presence? Look in Psalm 60. Three, I believe it is. Not only did David have a hunger for the Lord's presence, but he had a hunger for the Lord's power. In Psalm 63, verse number 1, he said, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and a thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory so have i seen thee in the sanctuary because thy loving kindness is better than life my lips shall praise thee thus will i bless the lord thus will i bless thee while i live i will lift up my hands in thy name my soul shall be satisfied as with mar and fatness and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips david said lord I've got a longing in my heart. I've got a hunger in my heart to see thy power and to see thy glory. You ever have a hunger like that? I pray and I long to see days of revival when, when it'll cause us to hunger and thirst after the glory of God. It'll cause us to hunger and thirst after his power and his glory, to see his power and his glory as we've seen in days gone by, as we've read in days gone by, to hunger and to see the glory of God. David said, Lord, because thy loving kindness is better than life. Not like this. A lot of folks wonder why they accuse us sometimes of being Baptocostal around here. They see these folks waving their hands and and different things in the service. But David said, Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. Not anything wrong with lifting your hands to the name of the Lord. Not anything wrong with having a hunger for his presence and for his power and his glory, to see his glory in the sanctuary as we've seen in days gone by. Nothing wrong with blessing him with our lips. Nothing wrong with lifting up our hands in his name. We get hungry for the things of God. It'll cause us to want to see and experience His presence and His power. I pray that this generation will not pass without knowing what it is to experience the presence and the power of God. Amen. Oh, if we had a hunger. You know what I believe about this hunger? I just simply say it this way and I'm going to move on. You know what I believe about this hunger? I believe you can have as much of God as you want. I believe God can be as, as dominant in your life as you allow him to be. You can have as much of God as you want. It just depends on how much you want 
The problem is that m most of us don't want much of him. We want just enough of him to get by, but we don't want him to really take too much control of our lives. But oh, that there would be a hunger for the things of God, the hunger and thirst. He said if we hunger and thirst, we should be filled. Third place tonight goes right along with what I'm just saying. I long to see a revival that contains the real glory of God. Now, I'm not going to be critical tonight. I don't intend to be. I'm just going to tell you some things I know. When I'm talking about the glory of God, the manifested glory of God, I've seen a lot of things go on in the last 24 years of serving God in churches. I've seen a lot of things go on in the name of the Lord that I don't believe God was in a million miles of. I think God and the Holy Spirit's been blamed for a lot of things that, that God's not in. Now, I'm convinced of this one thing. I believe when a man's in the Spirit of God, things will be done in decency and in order. And I'm not talking about rolling the floor and foaming at the mouth. And I'll tell you what we've done. We've taken that crowd that has gone off the deep end and become fanatical, and they've tried to paint God into a lot of things that he's not there. And we've taken, we've taken the the extreme crowd, and we've went to the extreme the other way. Now, I went through a time and a period in my ministry when I thought I was God. Not really, but I just acted like it. I know none of y'all have ever been that way. But I went through a time in my ministry when I could sit and tell you everything God was in and everything God was not in in a service. I could tell you who God was really on and who God was not on. I could tell you what, what, what was in the Spirit and what was out of the Spirit. And I went through one of them critical times where I just sat around and, and just, you know, like, a, like a, one of God's watchdogs to determine what was in the Spirit and what was out of the Spirit and what was the glory. And you want me to tell you what I did in the process of all that? I died dead as a hammer. I died dead as a hammer. And my soul on the inside, like the star of the day, spiritually, well, I was sitting around judging everybody else and wondering what God was in, what God was not in. I wondered if this was wildfire, or if this was in the flesh, or if this was just emotions, or if this was the Spirit and all that. I dried up and died going through all that, trying to figure all that out. But I come to the conclusion that there have been some times over these years that I've experienced a real manifestation of God's glory and God's power, and I wasn't going to sit around and die trying to judge everybody else. I was going to get in on what God wanted me to get in on and leave the rest of them up to God. And I'm not for fanaticism. I said a moment ago, I'm not for rolling the floor and foaming at the mouth, but I'm for God doing whatever he wants to do when he gets ready to manifest his presence. And I pray for revival that will so manifest the glory of God and so manifest the presence of God that it, I mean, that it overcomes our programs. I mean, it just overrides the programs. I said, I believe we ought to be prepared. But if God wants to override our programs and our plans, fine. Just, I mean, I'm talking about the glory of God that overrides our pride. Now listen, everybody don't have to worship the same. Everybody don't have to do the same thing. But if some of you folks sometimes would get rid of your stinking pride and just let go and enjoy Jesus when he comes by, whether it be lifting a hand or hollering glory, Whatever it is, you'd learn that that feels so good. <laughs> I mean, I believe everybody needs a pop-off valve. I mean, they sometimes you get so full of the Lord and that, that if you don't release it, I mean, listen, I believe this thing like my dad says. I've heard my dad say that, that old-time salvation and, old, you know, an old-time religion is like the big red measles. It'll either break out on your key, you one of the two. And I believe sometimes that we need to just forget about pride, forget about what other people are going to think about us, and just relax and enjoy Jesus. 
Nothing wrong with that. I read to you here a while back over in the book of 2 Chronicles. Chapter 5, I believe it is. I was reading it again today. 2 Chronicles 5, verses 13. In verse 14, he said, It came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one. That's a, that's a key. That's unity. They were gathered together as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not could not stand the minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. I said, I've seen things go on. And it, listen, there's nothing any more sickening than an old show of flesh. Is that not right? There's nothing any more sickening than, than just an old show of flesh and just somebody trying to you know, to, to work something up or, you know, or trying to get something stirred up. I wouldn't give you a plug nickel for that kind that you've got to gouge around on with an old sad song or an old sad story or tale to try to get people's emotions worked up. I wouldn't give you a nickel for that. But I don't think we ought to just can everything over, over some folks getting in the flesh once in a while. I think we ought to be in tune for God and have a hunger for God and have a hunger for His glory when He comes by and manifests His presence. If He wants to take over and override our programs and, you know, and crucify our pride and kill our preconceived ideas, we ought to just let God have it. That's, that's what I'm going to do. I've learned a long time ago. I said I done been through both of them. I've done been through both sides of that thing, and I've got settled on which side of the fence I'm on. I'm going to die enjoying Jesus. My mind's made up. Amen. And I'd rather fight and switch. I'd rather dig ditches and pastor a dead church. Now, God's my witness. He hears what I'm saying. I'd rather work manual labor on the job than to pastor a dead church. In fact, I believe I heard Thomas say not long ago he'd been the last dead service he ever wanted to go to. And I say amen to that. I pray we have a revival that contains the glory of God that will just override our programs, that'll crucify our pride, that'll just cut to pieces our preconceived ideas, you know, we could get in it sometimes if it'd if it go the way we thought it ought to go, couldn't we? <laughs> we, we, we could enjoy it if, we, if it'd go. Why, well, listen, it don't always go around here the way I think it ought to go. But why does God care what I think? <laughs> He's God. We just need to let him be God. God don't care what my preconceived ideas are. Now, if you ask me how things ought to go, I can tell you. May not be right every time, but I have my ideas and I have my opinions. But thank God for those times when the Lord just shoots them full of holes and God just comes through. Now, what I'm talking about, when I'm talking about the revealed glory of God, you see, in these preconceived ideas, <clears throat> here's what a lot of people think. When the glory of God's manifested, you know what that means to a lot of people? That means a preacher's not going to preach that day. That means God's going to bless the singing and we're going to sing it out and shout it out. Well, that may not necessarily be so. God may want to pour his glory out during the sermon sometime. <laughs> Amen? I'm just telling you how we got these preconceived ideas and we just think God's got to do it a certain way. God can pour his glory out in such a way that you can't describe it. You, you can't tell God how to do things. God is God. And what I'm saying, when God does come by and manifest his glory to us and reveal his glory to us, we ought to just yield our will to him, say, God, whatever you want, we're for it. If they call us holy rollers, if they call us fanatics, whatever they want to tag us by, just, you know, just so be it. We're just God. 
I, I'm, I'll tell you something else I'm kind of sick of. I'm just kind of shooting around right now. I might as well go ahead and shoot this while I'm here. I'll tell you something else I'm kind of burnt out on is these folks say, well, what kind of Baptists are y'all? What kind of Baptists are y'all? Are y'all Southern Baptists? Are y'all Independent Baptists or what? You know what I got where I tell folks? I'm just a saved Baptist. I'm just a saved Baptist because I think there's a little in both of them crowds that God's not proud of. Southern and independent, amen. Say amen right there, that's the truth. I'm just a saved Baptist. Well, I better move on. I'm talking about the thing my heart longs for is revival that contains the real glory of God. It cuts through all this pretense and everything and just lets God be God. A revival, and if we have these things step by step the way I'm talking about right here, this point right here will be easy. And that is this, that'll create a real love and unity among the family of God. I'm talking about a revival that'll make you love, folks. You just didn't think you could like, much less love. I mean that you find yourself loving folks that you just didn't think was possible to love them. And, and we, we've propped up on this old crutch for so long. Well, I love them, but I just don't like their ways. My soul, their ways are them. My ways are me, folks. You love me for the way I am or you don't love me. You, you, you can't say, well, I love old Brother Burma, but I don't like his ways. I hate his ways, but I, I love him. My ways are me. My ways are being manifested right now as I preach. You got to just take me the way I am and love me the way I am. That's the way Jesus loves me. He loves me as I am. I'm talking about real revival. Just make you love, folks. Make you forgive one another. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking about this old pretense stuff. We, boy, we, we've learned how to do it so well. We know how to shake their hand and hug their neck and pat them on the back, and, you know, and, and we know how to play that game. When deep in our heart we're gritting our teeth under our breath the whole time, we're shaking hands with them, wishing that, that you hadn't got caught, you know, where you, where you had to speak to them, where you had to talk to them, where you had to shake hands with them. You say, preacher, how do you know some of that stuff? I've been there. I've been there. I know how to play all them games. Man, I've been at this for a long time. I know how to play all them games. But God sees right through all that pretense. You know what I come to realize one, one day? I come to realize that the only thing that'll keep that power line open is for me to be real in my heart. Not only with God, but to be real with man. Now, I'm not standing up here looking down my nose at you like I'm a spiritual giant. These people that ruffle my feathers sometimes these people that I have to pray and make an effort to love them. But I want to tell you something. If I'm going to be right with God, I'm going to love them. And I'm, I'm not going to hypocrite and love them. I'm not going to stand and shake their hand, smile their face, and grit my teeth under my breath. If I'm going to shake their hand, hug their neck, and smile in their face, it's going to be real. Because God, he cuts, he cuts that power off. I found out a long time ago there's not anything worth your power with God. Nothing. I never have met an individual that I dislike so much that it was worth me forfeiting my power and my blessing for. And when you realize that it's going to cut your power off and it's going to cut your blessing off, you're going to get on your knees and you're going to pray for God to help you be enough like Jesus to love them folks and forgive them folks when they do you wrong. Amen? I'm still preaching about revival. I believe real revival will do that kind of thing. I believe real revival cuts through all that facade and cuts through all that hypocrisy and pretense and makes you real and genuine. You know what this world needs to see? A real Christian. A real Christian. It's like a little boy asked his daddy. He said, Daddy, he said, how do I be a Christian? How do I be a Christian? And the story said that the man set his little boy down, you know, and he took the Bible and he described to him what a Christian was, the best he could from the Bible. He said, when he got through, the little boy looked up at his daddy and he said, well, have I ever seen one? You know what the world's looking for tonight? The world's looking to see 
a real Christian. I long for revival that will create a real love and unity among God's family that we love one another and appreciate one another and respect one another like we do in the family of God. Now, just like your family, just like your family that sits around your table, y'all don't always agree on everything. You have differences. And you disagree. But you know what you do? You keep on loving one another. Before long, fellowship's restored around the table. Things are back to normal. And that's the way it ought to be in the family of God. That, that it's not that we're not going to have differences at times. Christians are going to have differences. But they're not going to stay divided. They're going to learn to love one another. If God's really living in their heart the way he should. One last thing, and I'm through. I long to see a revival that convicts sinners and brings them to the Savior. Far too many churches where sinners can go and sit through a service and be comfortable and enjoy the entertainment. They're never convicted of their sin. They're never brought face to face with eternity. I long to see a revival that has God so much in it that sinners can't be comfortable in the house of God anymore. You remember that old song I was thinking about today? I hadn't heard it long, long time, probably since I was a kid. Do you remember that old song we used to sing? I went there to fight, but oh my, that night, something got a hold of me. Oh, can you remember those days when sinners, they didn't go to church to get saved? They had no intentions of getting saved. They went to satisfy a mom or a dad or a husband or a wife or a brother or sister or a nagging neighbor. They just went, had no intentions of getting saved. But when they got there, God was so real. He convicted their heart of sin, and they found themselves getting saved. I mean, God, when, power, when the power of God is real, it'll manifest itself in such a way that sinners can't get comfortable. I remember one night I was preaching. There's a fellow sitting back on my right. It's been many years ago. A fellow sitting back on my right, and I was up preaching. He jumped up and interrupted me in my sermon. He said, Preacher, I can't sit here no longer. I, I've stood this as long as I can. If you'll hush, I want to get right with God. Right in the middle of my sermon. Now, I don't mind being interrupted like that. I was preaching one time in Indiana on the cross. And I remember a fellow named, his name was Bob Brown. And they said he, they'd never seen him go to the altar, never seen anything move him. He was just kind of a showman. But I, I preached on the cross that morning. And I remember Bob Brown getting up out of his seat. Before I ever got through preaching, while I was preaching, he got up out of his seat. He fell on his knees about 10 or 12 feet before he got the altar, and he crawled on his face to the altar. And I've never heard anybody sob and weep any more broken than he did. Folks, God's conviction is still real, and, and there's something wrong with us. I'm going to tell you, I'm backslid, and I'm speaking to myself. I'm backslid if a sinner can come to my church and sit through the service and enjoy it and be entertained and never be convicted of his sin. I long to see a revival of those days when God's presence is so real that it convicts the heart of sinners to the point they want to get saved. And they'll come and get saved. God moves in on you. God moves in with Holy Ghost conviction. I mean, you, 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 you got to do something. You, I mean, you got to do something. Come ahead, Brother Tom. And we share this with you. Philip. I think I've shared this with you before. Not much I hadn't shared with you before. I've been preaching to you for nearly six years. There's a fellow of the first church I pastored. And he was hard and calloused. And his wife told me how he used to be before he got saved. And she'd get up and go to church on Sunday, and he'd give her a fit about going to church. And she said he'd, he'd mock her and make fun of her, and he'd hand her a grocery sack, a paper sack, when she started out the door and say, here, bring me back a sack full of your religion. It's all that good. Said, so bring me back a sack full of it. Make a long story short, 
he come to church one Sunday morning and when the invitation was about to be given he was going to get up and leave and he got to the back door and did an about face at the back door he got up with every intention of leaving and going out the door and got to the back door and the Holy Ghost turned him around and he ended up on the altar getting saved when God's around, God changes your intentions. I've seen it. I can stand here and tell you one experience right after another where God's changed. But when Holy Ghost conviction is around, God's around, I mean, things change. A lady called me one morning and said, Preacher, said, I'm afraid this morning. Come to church. She got saved. She said, my husband's name was Junior. Juniors are mean. They're just mean people. His name was Junior. She said, I'm afraid to come to church this morning. She said, Junior's got up rattling and raving. He's mad. And he says, if I go to church, he's going to come down there and he's going to tear that service all to pieces. He's going to disrupt that service. And I said, well, just come on to church. I said, we got some pretty good-sized deacons around here. I said, I think they, know, they can keep order if need be. Tell him just, tell him just come on. And I really didn't know. I mean, I, I didn't know what else to tell her. I told her that. But, but I wasn't that brave about it. I want to tell you, I prayed all morning about it. God get hold of his heart. Well, you know who the first one on the altar was that morning to get saved when, when I gave the invitation? I preached on salvation. It was old Junior. Big old rough-looking fella. He just got out of prison, been in prison for insurance fraud or something. And he, he come and got saved. What I'm trying to say is this that when God's around and conviction is real, whatever reason folks come for, they may have no intention of getting saved, but when God gets in things, things change. Things change. I long to see them days when God is among us to the point that sinners get convicted of sin and they get so miserable that they can't, I mean, that, that, that they can't live, sleep, or eat or nothing, that they've got to get saved. Some of you sitting right there tonight you were just such a person as I'm describing that God had you to the point you were so miserable that you thought you was going to die and fall off into hell any minute if you didn't get saved when you got saved. I still believe that God can still convict the hearts of sinners and bring people to Jesus in just that, just that manner if he needs to. Well, every head's bowed and every eye closed. Father, I pray tonight, Lord, as we've tried to share our hearts, the longing of our heart is to see real revival. And Lord, in my heart, I'd love to see real revival break out in this place among our people. Lord, I pray as a preacher and as a pastor that you'll help me, first of all, Lord, to forget others. Help me to face myself and to be willing to forsake my sin. And Lord, to allow you to do a real work in my heart and in my life. Lord, I want revival to break out in my own heart and in my own life. I want to experience a real work of God in my own heart and in my own life. And Lord, as that principle of your word is taught, to revive me, revive us, and revive thy work. Lord, let it start with me tonight. I don't know about the lives of the others here in this building tonight. I pray they'll just do what they need to do. But I pray revival has started my own heart and my own life. Move in this invitation do what needs to be done in each of our hearts. Help us to be honest with you tonight. Help us to be honest with you. And you, Lord, allow you to do what you want to do in our lives. And we'll thank and we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.